All right, so let's go through some examples, and this will be a bit of a scuffed class because I guess their wireless went down. Uh, yikes. Well, your wireless, I guess, works, but mine doesn't, so it's back up. It's back up. Mine is still dead. Yep, mine's still dead, so it's recording, so I'll just upload it to YouTube later. So we'll, I guess we'll have to struggle through it and do what we can do out of this. So let's look at some examples. So here is the simplest program we're going to have. So remember, there's the standard file descriptors 0, 1, and 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare a buffer that's a size of 4096, which is a size that the kernel really, really likes. That we'll see why that is later. And then all it does is in this while loop, so this while loop just calls read over and over again, and that read system call will return how many bytes are actually filled in that buffer. And when there's, uh, yeah, and just, while we're reading some bytes, so while we're reading more than zero bytes, all it's going to do is write to file descriptor one, that buffer, and how many bytes it read from that buffer. So every read system call, it fills up a buffer, and then we write that back out to file descriptor uh, one. So here we do some light error checking. We see if write returns an error, so it's like a standard C wrapper function, so if it returns negative one, there's some type of error. And then we go ahead, we'll print out that error, we'll kill this process and don't let it go on. Then here, we'll just make sure that we write out the same number of bytes we read in, so everything lines up and we don't have any weird partial writes or anything like that. And then we hit the bottom of the while loop, so we just go over and over again. So we keep on reading over and over again. And then the only time we'll break out of this while loop is when read returns something that is zero or less. So if it's negative one, that means it's an error and we'll print out that error number. And otherwise, we'll assume that the bytes read should be zero, which indicates, hey, you're done. That's it, that's all you can read. And then we would just go ahead and exit. So if we go ahead and run this program, so it doesn't do anything. So it just sits there, it's not finished yet because it's waiting for us to type something. So if I type hello, it throws it back out at me, which is cool. Every time I press enter, it works like that. So hi, press enter, spits it back out. So does this look like any program you've ever used before? Who can hazard a guess what this program actually is? <laughs> yeah. Echo, is it echo? Echo is fair, no, it is not echo, because if I type echo, it just, eh, throws it back out at me. Any other guesses? So what about cat? So if I do cat, well, it kind of looks the same already, and if I do hello, hit enter, it says hello back. Huh, weird. And if I say hi and press enter, it throws hi back. So spoiler alert, that cat program, we actually just wrote cat. That is cat. Whatever we just wrote, reading from zero and writing to one is exactly what cat does. Cat is a little more complicated than that, but not really. Because everyone, OK, show of hands if it, people have used cat like, uh, have people used cat like that before? Yeah, so everyone's used cat like that. So if I use cat like that, what do I get? I get the contents of that file spit back out at me. Okay, well, if I want something like that, I'm without rewriting our core logic of our read-write thing that just reads everything from zero and writes everything to one, well, What I can do, which is why, uh, which is why I recommended in lab one that you should use, oh God, that you should use the open system call because it's a bit closer to what we actually want. So without 
rewriting anything, I'll, without rewriting the core loop, I'm going to add another argument so it will take up to two arguments and say, hey, if I have a second argument, so the first arg is going to be the program name by convention, and then I'll say, hey, if there's two arguments, I'll take the second one as a file name. So if I get a file name, I'll close file descriptor zero, so I can close whatever I've opened. I'll just say, hey, I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to use that as standard input. Whatever you gave me, I'll close it. And then I will open the first argument as a read-only file. So I'll just use it as a file. And as part of open, you get a file descriptor. And the rules of Linux and most other Unixes are it will use the lowest file descriptor whenever it creates a new one for you. So this file is going to be represented by file descriptor zero. So it's just going to spit out file descriptor zero back out me. And now instead of being whatever it was before, file descriptor zero is now a file. So if I do that, I'll check for errors. And then otherwise, my program's exactly the same as before. So if I go ahead and do that, well, then my build open example, I can go ahead and do what I would do for cat, where I want to see the contents of the file, and I get the contents of the file. Because all it does is, it doesn't care, it just reads from file descriptor zero. File descriptor zero could represent whatever, and that's kind of the nice thing about Unixes. You don't have to rewrite your program, you can write like very simple things that don't really do that much, that are actually fairly powerful. So any questions about that? Yep. So the uh, read and write system calls, all they want is a file descriptor, and you don't know what that actually represents. And it's just by convention, whenever you start a program, zero is standard in, and that should be something I should be able to read from. And then one is standard out, which is something I should be able to write to. It's just by convention, and you have no idea whatever they represent. So I didn't specify, I just read from file descriptor zero. And by default, if you launch like an application on your terminal, whatever you type will go, your shell will make everything go to file descriptor zero for you. So that's the nice thing. You don't have to write any like keyboard handling code. You just get bytes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So here, if I tried to read file descriptor one, so if I try read file descriptor one, usually if you do that, that's really bad because file descriptor one's supposed to be something you actually only read from, and it's like undefined if you can uh, write to it, or you're supposed to only uh, write to file descriptor one, not read from it. But if I go ahead and do this, I assume it's going to work. So let's go ahead, oops. So it still works, which is kind of weird. <laughs> I see your face. So <laughs> it's kind of weird, but remember last class when we actually saw in our shell and whatever application gets launched there what the file descriptors actually are? So file descriptor 0, 1, 2 by default represent like the pseudo terminal thing, and file descriptor 0, 1, and 2 all point to the exact same thing. <laughs> so in this case, they all point to the exact same thing. So in this case, it doesn't matter which one we use because they're all the same. But if I like gave a file to that instead, some really weird things would happen because we can change what file descriptor zero is. So you shouldn't do that, but in this case, it works. Here, let me undo that. So the convention is you should only read from file descriptor zero. And if you do do that, like sometimes it might work, but other times it might fail really, really bad, and you'll have to kind of figure, and you'll see. All right, any other questions? OK, so here, I'll go back and show you a few fun things first. Oh, right. And also, 
some of you may have thought there's like an end of file or something weird with that, like a special end of file character when you're finished with a file, but that's not the case. So how you signify end of file is if I type this and you know type cat and I'm here, I want to close this eventually and like end the process. So the only way to actually end the process cleanly is how would most of you end the process? And, yeah. All right, so anyone else use anything other than control C? Do you know what control C does? What, what does control C do? Okay, so some people just like panic control C, we're all good. So yeah, I can control C. I see some weird stuff there, which we'll explain today, that like 130 is kind of weird. And it gives some type of error, which indicates something bad happened. Well, if you actually want to like this to exit cleanly, what you should actually hit here is control D. If I hit control D, it just stops. So what control D will do is actually say, hey, I'm done, I'm done giving information to this program, so I will just close it and it will signal to that process that hey you can't read any more information and that read system call looking at the code we can kind of deduct what it did since it exited nicely oh please close so to get break out of the loop it would have read back something that is zero or less and it didn't get a negative one and we have an assert there that bytes read is zero before we exit so the only way, when we press control D, it just makes read return zero bytes, and that indicates you're done with the input. So there's no special end of file character, there's nothing like that. The only way you know you're not getting any input anymore is if read returns zero. That's it. Yep. So the question is, what is it reading when I'm not typing anything? So like, I type something and now it's just sitting here waiting for me? So what read will do is read is kind of like that wait system call that will block until something happens. So in this case, read is going to block. I've read all the input that's there already, so it's just going to sit there and block that process until it gets some more input. Yeah. Control C is not copy on Linux's. Yeah. On Windows, yeah, that's the default thing. Okay. Uh, it might work on the Windows terminal. Oh no, I haven't really used the Windows terminal. Okay. Does in PowerShell. Does in PowerShell. It copies? Okay. Oh no, it, it does whatever, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. But it won't quite do that because it's Windows. <laughs> so we'll figure out what it actually does. So, go back. So yeah, so control D is when you want to stop something and say, hey, I won't give you any more input, and that's the end of file. There's no special end of file character. That was all a lie if every, anyone's ever told you that. Uh, at least on Linux, that's not a thing. Because that wouldn't make sense. So remember, like, that read interface is really, really generic. It just gives you some bytes. And if there was a special end of file character, well, it would have to be a value of something, and then Whatever that value was, well, you couldn't use it to actually as information because it would represent end of file, which is something which would restrict you, which is something you don't, don't want. So end of file means read returns zero. So again, here's read. If you want to look at, there's a man page, so you always need to check for errors. Again, same thing, zero, negative one means there's an error and it'll set that global variable called error no. And then write, same things, it returns the number of bytes written, and you can't really assume it's always successful. Most of the time it will be. And again, you need to save error no like I'm doing because another function might set it because if it's doing printf or something like that, well, that will call write and might itself have an error of some variety. So there's also, another part of it, so it's like, well, who's giving me bytes that I'm reading? So we know there's another process that was writing bytes 
to whatever file descriptor zero was that I'm reading from. So there's another process that wrote bytes and I read them. And then whatever bytes I wrote out, something else must have read them because I actually saw what was typed. So even without that, you get some communication essentially for free that you don't have to set up. And to this point, you probably didn't even realize what was going on. It just kind of worked. So here's that thing to illustrate that the standard file descriptors are quite powerful. So remember what I did, I just opened, I closed file descriptor zero and I opened a file and it was file descriptor zero and then without changing my program, it just did cat things and it could dump the output of my file. So what I could actually do instead is do some little shell tricks I'll show you. So Instead of running that open example and then giving the file name, well, there's some standard stuff you can do with like a Linux shell that plays with the file descriptors for you. So instead of doing you know, open example with that open example file and then getting the arguments and opening the file and doing all that, well, the shell actually has some nice stuff for you. So if you type something like that, that arrow it basically tells you, hey, that file, I want to be the uh, standard in file descriptor. And the shell will go ahead and open that file for you and replace it with file descriptor zero. So I didn't actually have to write that open system call or do anything. So to illustrate that, let me go back and I'll show you that. So with my example that didn't even have a read system call, it was just read write example. Well, I could use that arrow that says, basically, I'll give you a file on the right and replace that with standard in. So if I do that, uh, what was it called? I get the output of that file directly and I never even had to write an open call at all. I just kind of let my shell do it for me and you can write programs like this that can use files that don't even have an open call in them whatsoever if you know how to use the shell. So that's pretty cool. And then other things you can do. So some other things you can do is this line character. It's actually called a pipe. So you can actually redirect across multiple processes. So I could cat, you know, cat that file name, which is going to output all of the contents of this file to the standard out, to its standard out. And then what this character does is essentially connect the two processes together. So it will essentially make anything this writes to standard out, this process will read as standard in. So anything it writes, the other one will read and that's how you connect things together. So if we do something like that, let's go back. So if I cat say read write example, I can use that pipe character and then use my read write example program and I'll get the same contents of the file but now you know this program would have opened that file and wrote it to standard out and then in this process because of this character connecting them together whenever it read from standard out or standard in it wrote the other or it read information from the other processes standard out and then we know what this does, it just spits everything it read back out to standard out and we actually see the contents. But it's kind of a, kind of a roundabout way. So any questions about that one, which is kind of weird. Yeah. So the question is, is it okay to think of standard in and standard out as files? Uh, generally, you want to just think, them, think of them as just something to read bytes from and write bytes to. We'll see all different things that they could actual, actually be. So files is one we already kind of know, and now we kind of know this character kind of connects them together. So I wouldn't quite say they were files for this. There's like some magical thing that glues them together. So, and we'll kind of figure out what that is later. Any other questions? So, spoiler alert, because of that, like, read bytes, write bytes being super generic, well, 
your web browser, whenever it wants to communicate with stuff, essentially uses read and write because that's the only option. And now that represents a network connection instead of a file or instead of whatever magical thing this is. Yeah. So every process is independent of each other. So I only change the file descriptor for a specific process, which doesn't change anything else. So kind of what we've already been learning about everything being independent. So something forked at some point. But after that, all the processes are completely independent, so they don't really monkey with each other. Yep. Yeah, so both of these programs, so this will be a process, and this will be a process, and they'll be running at the exact same time, and then just communicating through that, those file descriptors. But there'll be two processes that exist at the exact same time. Yep. Okay, so we want to figure out what in the heck control C does. So yeah. I've preempted this, so you can also use control C to stop, but we don't exactly know what it does and why. So what control C does is it basically interrupts your program. So we've seen interrupts before in kind of other courses. So this is a interrupt for normal programs. So you can actually send them and that's what you do when you hit control C. So a interrupt is in this context, they just call them signals, but they're basically just interrupts for processes. And there are different reasons for interrupting your processes, and they're just given a number. So a kernel will interrupt your program with some number that indicates some interrupt. And it tells you, you know, based off that number, it, you're supposed to deduce what actually the reason for it is. So if you press Control C, that will send an interrupt to that process which is called sig init. So all of them will be called sig something. And sig init is supposed to represent an interrupt from a keyboard. That means, hey, I interrupted you, the user interrupted you, so you should probably do something. So what the default handler will do is, well, I didn't write anything that has to do with signals in my program. I just wrote a main and some reads and writes, and that was it. So the kernel and or C, We'll have some default handlers for you, like interrupt handlers that you're hopefully kind of used to. And by de the default handler for sig init or any of them is just to exit that process straight away and set an exit with an exit status of 128 plus whatever that signal number was. So if we go back to this, whenever we did uh, build although I just didn't know. Whenever I did this and I hit control C, again, this number here is the exit status of the process if it's not zero. So it exited with 130. So we can you know, do some simple math to figure out what signal number that is. So 130 minus 128 is two. So our process got sent signal two and then just exited. Hmm, weird. So you can actually set your own signal handlers with this system call called sig action. And it is just a, hopefully you've written interrupt handlers before maybe, but it's just a function that doesn't return a value and takes an int argument, which is the signal number, and then you're free to do with it whatever you want on Linux x86 or Linux ARM, whatever. These are the standard numbers, so two, is sig init, which is interrupt from keyboard. Nine is sig kill, which sounds slightly violent, which is terminate immediately. Then sig 11 is something you've all probably got before. So that is uh, seg, uh, sig seg v, which is a seg fault. That's where the name comes from. That's when you have screwed up malloc, which probably everyone has done. And then there is uh, 15, which is sig term which is like terminate, but terminate nicely, and we'll see what the difference between those are. So a signal, how that works, whenever it gets sent to your process, your process 
essentially stops executing whatever it was executing and that and will jump immediately to that single handler and run until it's completed and then if it returns it starts it continues wherever it left off so if you want to like argue correctness it's kind of like those two processes running at the same time. You don't know what order they're going to come in. And for signals, you have no idea when a signal is going to come in. So you have no choice if you register a signal handler. It's just going to run whenever a single handler comes in. If it's a bad time, well, that's too bad for you. So this is an example of concurrency, switching executions like that, which we'll see more in depth later in the course. But basically, it just switches your execution. So let's go ahead and show signal example and press control C. So in signal example, what do I have? So in signal example, it just checks to see if it has arguments. Otherwise, it's going to be exactly that uh, open example, so that open read and write. So I'm just adding signals to that program we had initially. So first, it will go ahead, open the file as file descriptor zero if there's, you know, if we give it an argument. Otherwise, it will register two signals. So it will register sig init, which is whatever gets sent when we hit control C, and then register sig term, which is the nice way of shutting down. So let's go up. So register signal, it's kind of a bunch of boilerplate code that you don't really need to be terribly concerned about. But basically, you just set a bunch of things. All the defaults are probably fine. The only thing you actually is important to give it is which function to run when a signal comes in. So here I basically tell it, for these signals, I want this handle signal function to run whenever a signal comes in. And then this sig action registers them with the kernel. So whenever someone types control C or whatever, then this handle signal function is going to run. So let's see what that looks like. And here's my handle signal function. So all it does is say, screw you, I don't care. And it tells you about it. So let's go ahead and run that. So here's the same program. Like it was like my cat. So I'm typing, I'm typing. Now, before this lecture, you would have just typed control C to get it out of it. Now, if I hit control C, well, oh, something weird. It says ignoring signal two, which is what I thought, but I thought it would just kind of ignore me and continue on. But I got an error from read. So that's interesting. So by programming somewhat defensively, we know that, hey, system calls can fail just because a signal comes in. So it failed and got an error that said interrupted system call. Please retry. So we didn't handle that. So we can go ahead and handle that since that's something that we know now that can happen. Oops. So to handle that in my loop here, I can check, hey, does read return an error? If read returns an error, I'll check error no. And this is the error no that represents, hey, a, uh, your system call got interrupted. So if my system call gets interrupted, I go, oh, yeah, sure, don't worry about it. Continue and just read again, because I know that actually wasn't an error. I just got interrupted, so I'll just restart and try again. And then otherwise, it was really an error, so I'll just break out of the loop. So now with our new and improved one that will restart system calls, I can go ahead, I run this. It looks the same as before, hello. And then if I hit control C now, this says screw you. <laughs> and I, I can't type anything, it still work, and it still works. But I type control C again, and it says screw you. So you can actually do this if you want, like if your friend hasn't taken this course yet and you want to give them a program, just do this where it ignores everything that happens to them and they probably won't ever figure out how to actually get rid of it. <laughs> so. That's something you can do. So let's figure out how to actually get rid of it. So if we want to actually get rid of it, well, the nice way of doing it is to send a signal. So signals are, there's that nice signal that's like, hey, terminate, please. So 
you would think to send signals to a process, it would be like a system call, like send signal or something like that, some nice name that makes sense. The system call to send signals to a process is called kill. Why it's called kill, I have no idea. But kill, all that is, is to send a signal to a process. So if I want to kill what's running, so right now, this is the thing that's running, so I'll get its process ID. So the kill command will basically just do the system call for you. So I'll say kill this process that's running because I can't hit control C and I don't know how to close it. So I'll just ask it to kill it, which will send a signal to it. So if I do that and switch back over, oh, it says screw you again. So, but now it says screw you for a different reason. It says ignoring signal 15. And if we go back to the slide, well, 15 was supposed to be sig term, which was the nice way of saying to exit. So the intended use of that is like, someone really wants me to exit, but I should clean up free memory, maybe you know, write out files if I need it, do some quick cleanup so I can exit safely. But they're signals, so you're free to just ignore them and be like, yeah, I don't want to exit right now. I'm good. So, eh. so you can see there's more violent options here. So there's that nine, which is seg kill. So that seg kill one is a bit more fun. So by default, kill will just send that 15, which is terminate nicely. But you can do kill dash nine, so that will send signal nine to that process. And if you've ever heard kill dash nine before, that's what it's from. And then if I do that, hey, I look here and it just says killed. I get the number that's associated with it, so that's 128 plus nine. And it says killed and it's done. So you might be asking, well, what's the difference between them? And like, well, I could ignore sig term, so what's to stop me to just, you know, oops. Well, you know, they can't stop me. I'll ignore that too. So we, eh, let's go ahead and try it. Ah, smart. So the difference between 15 and nine is nine is like, no, I'm serious. That's like the kernel, you die. So you're not allowed to ignore nine and that's defined by the kernel, doesn't let you ignore it. And there's no default handler because you can't handle it. The default thing is the kernel kills you, yeah. No, so I'm getting an error from that SIG action system call. Okay. So this isn't C preventing me, this is like I got error from that system call. So the kernel will not let me do it. So dash nine is like, you can't ignore it, that's like immediately die, so that might actually help you if you, know, if you have a process that is running wild, well, you can just, kill dash nine it and it has no other choice but to stop running. So now you know how to actually recover your system. So that's pretty good. So uh, yeah. Well, if I just close the terminal? Oh, geez. Okay, so let's get rid of this. So this might be a bad idea, but let's try it. Actually, uh, here, so let's figure out what my process ID is quick. So my process ID is, okay, so that's the process ID of my shell that's running. So I have that down the other one. So here's my shell that's running. And your question is, I'm going to execute this thing. And I can't kill it, I can't do anything. So you're like, instead of killing this, I'll kill essentially its parent. Okay, so 
Anyone want to hazard a guess what happens when I kill its parent? Yeah. Yeah, it should be an orphan process. And if it's an orphan process, it should get reparented. Is it still running? Is it a zombie? No, it shouldn't be. So it should stick around. So bad things will happen, so I'll just be super serious. Oh, no such process. OK, cool. Oh, I think that one's mine. So let me kill that one. Hopefully that one isn't bad. OK, missed. <laughs> I killed something else by accident. Oh, OK, so it just disappeared from there. So my tab's done, so that terminal's now no longer there. So let's see if it's still running. So it's not actually running, which is a bit weird. So I did manage to kill it, but I kind of blew, <laughs> blew my own leg off in the process. But I did kill it. But So I don't recommend that. You could kill it directly, but in that case, it works. And we'll figure out why that worked later because it wasn't, it was probably still running when it got orphaned and it got reparented. So it probably should have just continued running and just kind of sat around and, you know, waited for some more input. So something definitely happened to it. But we'll, we'll get to that later. So, well, actually, I'll just spoil it now. So that one died because since we killed the parent, that's the thing that was actually managing that standard in file descriptor. So once we killed the parent, there was nothing else to write to whatever it was reading from standard in. So it would say, hey, there's no more bytes that can come in. So it would read zero and then just exit normally. So that's why it didn't stick around. So you could write something that does stick around, though. Yeah. Yeah, if I just opened a file, it would just stick around. So I, I kind of blew up my leg, so it'd probably take a bit too long to set that back up again. But yeah, it would stick around if it was actually a file. All right, any other questions? So that was fun. We did some stuff, so. Many, any other experiments? You didn't kill my machine yet, so that's pretty good. <laughs> so we only, like, moderately killed it. So here's that. So yeah, here was just showing that kill will send that sig term thing. Kill dash nine again is the serious version that the kernel will kill it, won't give it an opportunity to respond or whatever. It just immediately kills it. So you should use that as a last resort. Yeah. I knew oh, someone always asks. So the question is, can I kill one and say, hey, I mean it? And I said, hey, if I kill one, that's really bad. So. Let's make sure we make it to the end of the lecture and we'll end with that because it will probably end the lecture. <laughs> All right. So some other quick examples is like, so most operations you kind of want to do are non-blocking. So like read will block and wait will block. But if you want something to return immediately, well, there's non-blocking versions of it. So let, we'll see how to turn wait into a non-blocking call. So if you want it to be a non-blocking call, there's an option to wait PID if you want. And you give it W no hang, so it just returns instantly. So there's some other options. If we want to react to changes and we don't have a, and we only use non-blocking calls, so you, we have two options if we're not going to sit there and wait for it. We can either pull, which means we're just going to tr try it over and over and over again, or we can get an interrupt, which will be connected to signals and will hopefully, signals will help us with that. So let's look at wait with the pooling example and see what's bad with that. So we're gonna call wait PID over and over again until the child exits. And this is actually how some hardware will behave. So if you need to read some data from a device, one of the options you might have is just to ask it, hey, do you have anything for me now? Hey, do you have anything for me now? And you keep on asking over and over again like this. And the kernel, this would be like actually dealing with hardware. And let's see if we run it, if we get some type of drawback with that. So let's see. Here's our pull example. 
So in our poll example, we're kind of going back to the last lecture quickly. So we start off by forking, and then our child will go ahead and sleep for two seconds. And then in the other process, in our main parent process, we're just going to set up weight PID as being equal to zero, which is invalid, and then set up some space for that whatever uh, weight writes to. And then we're going to count how many times we actually pull. So now weight PID will be zero whenever we call weight and a child has not exited yet. So we're just going to say, well, there's no child that exited yet. Just increment count so I can see how many times I go through this loop. And then I'll just print out what attempt I'm at. And then I'll call weight PID with the PID of my child, give it the address to write some information to, and then give it this option that says, just return immediately, like don't block. So this will go over and over again. And then, of course, we'll have our error checking. And then if we break out of the loop, that means our child hopefully has exited. So we'll check if it's exited. And if it does, we'll return its value. And then if it doesn't, we'll just go say, we'll just exit from the process that says it's an error. And then they'll both exit with zero if they're successful. So the child should just sleep for two seconds, exit with zero, and then the parent should do all this stuff. So anyone has a guess how many attempts we might take if we do this approach instead of just calling wait and just laying it wait. So let's see how fast our thing actually is. Whoops. Oh, right, I killed my, you killed my shell. Okay, I'm in the wrong directory. So if I do that, it turns out it takes a lot of time. <laughs> so I essentially wasted, was that, like a quarter of a million calls by just saying, hey, are you done yet? 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 And imagine doing that like 200,000 times. It's pretty annoying. So I'm essentially just wasting my time by just asking over and over again. So anyone have a good idea of what I could do to not waste so much time? So wh what would I do if I didn't want to ask just as fast as I can? Yeah. Without using interrupts. Yeah. Yeah, so I could just add a delay. So. If I want to not waste as much time, you know, maybe I just like sleep for a second. So if I go ahead and sleep for a second, well, I'll be like, wait, are you done yet? Wait, are you done yet? Wait, are you done yet? And then, hey, it only took three, but now I have kind of the opposite issue where I'm a bit more efficient because I don't waste time checking, but I also, was essentially a second late, because it died at around two seconds, and I got it at around three. So this becomes like an engineering trade-off, where you're trading response time for essentially how much time you're wasting by just asking the question over and over again. So the longer you wait between them, the worse your response time is going to be, but the less time you're going to have wasted. So knowing the frequency to actually pull is kind of a choice that you'll have to make based off how important it is to get a response right away. So you can imagine if this was like a game or something and you were like a second behind your friend, well, then that's probably not good. Uh, okay, so, so the other thing we could do is we could do the interrupt example. So remember, I kind of said it before that, you know, when your child dies, you'll get poked. So that poking is the kernel will actually send you a signal when your child dies, and it's given a sig child as the signal number. So what we can do is we can say, hey, we'll handle that. And in that, you could just call wait exactly when your child dies, and your program can just actually create that child, do whatever, do useful things, and you don't have to worry about having to deal with it immediately. You just get interrupted as soon as it's done. You don't have to pull. You don't have to do anything. And it just works. So that really quick. And then we'll do something silly. So here's the same thing. So I just fork, make sure I don't have an error, sleep, 
And then in the main process, I just say, hey, I'm just going to go to sleep for like 999 seconds. I don't care. That could actually represent useful work. And then in the signal handler, I just see, hey, do I have sig child? If I do, I call wait. And then if I do, I would just immediately react to my child. So if I run that, I go to sleep, but I get interrupted from a signal, and I go ahead and wait immediately, and then it's all cleaned up and everything's good to go. So that's one way of doing it. And I'll wrap up, and then I will kill, I'll do something silly. Oh, yeah. OK, I'll just I'll fill it in next lecture. All right, so let's do something silly. So there was a question. Good question of like, hey, well, if I can kill dash nine something and we know one is really important, what happens when I do that? Oh, God. So kill dash nine one means my init process, that's like my orphanage and responsible for doing everything. I'll just kill it and let's see what happens. Kernel smart. So the kernel will not let you kill one because it knows it's important. So let's just be like, no, yeah, yeah I'm rude, I'm fine. It, so that case, nothing else happened. And if I look, uh, that doesn't give me an error. But basically, the kernel's smarter than you and won't let you kill init. So you can't actually brick your system, thank goodness, because that, that would, that, I could have actually ran this before. So you can't kill one, but um, what else did I kill? There's something like 70. No. 701. Okay, so this was, remember when something got reparented, it went to this, and this was like my system D for my user? So if I kill this, this should actually kill my user, and yeah. <laughs> so that killed my whole thing and essentially made me log in again. So if you want to kill your friend's system, you can go ahead and do that to their user, to their system D. So with that, just remember, pulling for you, we're on this together.